Welcome to uh, this lecture hosted by the Department of Philosophy. My name is Mark Nelson, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Um, I was getting ready to write my usual sort of introduction, looked at her website, liked her introduction of herself much better than mine, so I will quote extensively from it. And I'm mentioning this because I wish to avoid charges of plagiarism. Um, Frances Howard Snyder grew up in South Africa and dreamed of becoming a writer. She attended University of Cape Town studying philosophy, English, and Greek. Sadly, creative writing classes hadn't been invented yet. Uh, or if they had, they hadn't reached the tip of Africa. She found literature wonderful to read, but difficult to write about. Uh, so she focused on philosophy, earning a BA and an MA. Then she earned a PhD at Syracuse University in New York under the great Jonathan Bennett. Uh, and she also met and married her husband, Daniel, who is also a philosopher. After short stints at Wayne State in Detroit and Purdue University in Indiana, she moved with Daniel to the Pacific Northwest, uh, where she now teaches at Western Washington University in Bellingham. Uh, in 1999, she reports that she gave birth to twin sons, William and Peter, who absorbed most of her time for the next 12 years. On their 12th birthday, she found that she had more time and returned to her first love, which is fiction. I will add that Professor Howard Snyder has published dozens of articles in top philosoph philosophy journals, such as the Journal of Philosophy, Analysis, Philosophical Studies. But among philosophers, she's unusual in that she has also published um, quite a lot of short stories and pieces of fiction. You can think of it like a Venn diagram. So this here is philosophy. This here is story. She's written in both. She's even written in intersection. She's written um, in the places where philosophy and fiction overlap. Um, and that's what her talk may about this afternoon. It's entitled, Telling Someone Else's Story, Objections to Cultural Appropriation. I believe the plan is that Professor Howard Snyder will talk for somewhere in the vicinity of 40 to 60 minutes. Uh, then we will have uh, time for Q&A and discussion after. Um, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to uh, welcome her. Before I do that, I have one more announcement to make. That is, today's lecture is partially sponsored by the Society of Christian Philosophers, who have a grant program uh, that helps philosophy departments at small colleges bring distinguished Christian philosophers to campus. Uh, and we are grateful to the Society of Christian Philosophers uh, for helping us to do this. We're also grateful to Professor Howard Snyder for joining us today. So please join me in welcoming her to Westmont. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you to all of you for being here today and for having me in this beautiful town, this beautiful campus. Um, so my talk is called Telling Someone Else's Story, Objections to Cultural Appropriation. So um, it's customary in talking about cultural appropriation to start with some particularly egregious example. So I'm going to describe uh, three examples before I get into my own take on it. The first is a, a novel called Yellow Face by Rebecca Kwong. And in this story, we, we hear about a, a white woman who steals the manuscript of her deceased Chinese friend. It's, and it's about Chinese experience, and she publishes it under her own name. She sort of changes her name slightly to sound more Chinese. And she somehow justifies this to herself. Another example is from the New York Times, and this tells the story of the accounts, the real, the first one was fictional, but this is, this is real, um, about a, a man by the name of Solomon Linda, who was a Zulu, who wrote a song in 1923, which was an original early version of The Lion Sleeps Tonight. And this song was taken up by some, I think, American uh, songwriters and producers, and made into a hit song, and then used in the movie The Lion King. And people made millions off this song, but this 
for uh, Solomon Linda was buried in a, in a pauper's grave. Another example is the singer and songwriter Buffy St. Marie, Canadian person who um, uh, was portrayed and thought of herself or claimed to be a Cree and won uh, a number of awards as a Native Canadian, but it has recently been claimed with some evidence that she is actually uh, of Italian and English descent. And so this was basically a fraud. Um, and I, I'm not sure that that is completely decisively proved, but supposing it is, that would be, these are all examples of uh, what looks like cultural appropriation. In this talk, I want to talk about a few preliminaries and then mention several arguments against cultural appropriation and focus in on one called the knowledge argument and talk about some of my own experiences, so I am <laughs> doing that intersection thing, uh, as a reader and writer regarding cultural appropriation. And then I'd like to look at a paper by a philosopher by the name of Yuri Kath on knowing what it's like, and then return in light of my discussion of that paper to those experiences of mine. And I'd be interested to know in the Q&A what you think of those experiences or if you've had similar experiences and what your thoughts are. And then I'd like to mention some benefits of cultural appropriation as I'm going to um, define it. Now, um, so thinking about those first three examples, it's natural to think, well, you know, those are very bad. Those are cases of cultural appropriation, so cultural appro appropriation per se is wrong. But I think we have to be careful because um, it could be that some cases of cultural appropriation are wrong and some are not, just like some killings are wrong and some killings are not, and some kisses are wrong and some kisses are not wrong. Whereas the head of FIFA got in trouble for a, a kiss that went, went awry. Um, most kisses are fine. But anyway, so uh, same thing with cultural appropriation. Now, I think how, how we, where we end up on this question kind of depends on how we define cultural appropriation. Uh, I mean, I don't think in a substantive way, but I think there is a danger of, um, an amb there's an ambiguity in the way people define it, and so you end up with people arguing, talking past one another, using different definitions, coming away thinking that the person at the other end of the conversation is either an idiot or morally bankrupt for taking the opposing position, when really they're not actually taking an opposing position, they're just talking about something slightly different. Or perhaps even more worryingly, a single person might shift from one definition to the other in the course of a thought process or a, an argument and be guilty of equivocation. So I think it's helpful to sort out what we're going to mean by cultural appropriation when we use a term like that. Um, so the, the main divide here is with whether we want to have a morally loaded definition or a more morally um, neutral definition. The morally loaded definition, here's an example. This is from Britannica. Cultural appropriation takes place when members of a majority group adopt cultural elements of a minority group in an exploitative, disrespectful, or stereotypical way. Um, and that seems to imply, or at least strongly suggest, that the behavior is wrong. Here's a more morally neutral definition. Cultural appropriation takes place when someone who is not a cultural member adopts a reusable style, practice, or product of significant value to, often originating in, another usually minority culture. And I took that from a philosopher, Rebecca Tubell. But uh, philosophers, typically, when they write about this, go for a more neutral definition, as I will. So I'm going to go with roughly with Rebecca Tuvel's definition. Um, if you prefer the more morally loaded one, um, that's, that's fine. But then you should understand what I'm going to be saying as a debate about some examples and some cases that, and the question for you would be, is this a case of cultural appropriation? I'll, I'll be asking, is it wrong? And you can be asking, is it really cultural appropriation? And the difference between us hopefully will just remain a semantics one. Um, so I'm just going to mention a few things that get called cultural appropriation. Um, Lionel Shriver, the novelist, um, made a presentation on cultural appropriation and she um, wore a sombrero as a sort of in-your-face sort of gesture because a sombrero is an um, item of clothing from another culture. Um, uh, white models wearing dreadlocks have been accused of um, cultural appropriation. 
uh, the Benin bronzes and Elgin marbles in the British Museum seem not really to belong there. It seems like they were, you know, appropriation, I guess, means taking. And um, these seem like they maybe should go back to Nigeria and Greece where they were taken from. I, I guess it depends exactly how they got there, but you can see that that could be called cultural appropriation. Um, books by authors who pretend to a different identity. This is a little bit like the yellow face example. Um, the, the novel, The Education of Little Tree, was written by a man by the name of Forrest Carter who claimed to be Native American, uh, but subsequently it was determined that it was actually written by somebody called Asa Earl Carter, who was a white person who was a member of the KKK. Uh, anyway, so that's pretty bad. Um, but anyway, my focus here will be the telling of stories from the point of view of a member of a different, usually underrepresented culture. This is sometimes called um, subject appropriation or voice appropriation. Um, so examples of this are, and I'm, I'm going to be talking about writing, but I'm, I'll also include some examples that involve acting. And uh, some of the same criticisms arise um, at, at actors who represent some culture not their own. And I, I'm going to be talking a lot about examples of, of race, but I'm also going to talk about examples of gender and sexuality and um, um, disability and ability. So, so some of the examples will include those kind of cases. So um, the novel American Dirt by Janine Cummins is a novel that tells the story of um, Mexican immigrants. I, to be honest, I have not read this particular book. It's not going to feature in a big way, but it was criticized as an example of cultural appropriation because the author is white, or at least uh, there's a slight dispute about that, but she certainly looks white. She seems white. And um, she wrote this novel. And so some people objected that this was not her story to tell. Um, the other novel that I will talk in more detail about is uh, Jodie Picoult's Small Great Things. And Jodie Picoult is also a white writer. And she wrote a story about three from three different points of view, one, one of which is a black woman. And some people have criticized that for, for being cultural appropriation. Um, as I say, it also happens in acting. So here we have a picture of a, a, a young boy by the name of Jacob Tremblay who acted the role of Augie in the movie Wanda. And Augie has a condition called Treacher Collins condition that causes various issues and including sort of disfigurement. And so Jacob had to undergo a lot of makeup and prosthetics to, to look like this character. And some members of the disability community said this was wrong. We should have had, um, we should have found an actor who had that condition to play this role. Similarly, um, Brendan Fraser won the Oscar last year for playing um, a 600-pound man, and he wore a fat suit in the in the process. And again, members of the fat community—I guess that's a, an identity—complained, um, and they said that that you know if you're going to make a movie about uh, a very large person, you should you should hire somebody of that of that identity. And trans um, activists object to cisgendered people taking trans roles, as um, Eddie Redmayne did in the movie The Danish Girl. And the book, and also the TV show All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Dorr, features a, one of the two main characters is, is a blind girl. And I've read some very angry um, objections to this novel from blind people who say that that Anthony Dorr has no idea what it's like to be blind, and he shouldn't have written this, this character. So I'm interested in cases of primarily writing where, where someone tells the story, particularly from the point of view, from the inside of the, of the character of a, of a different identity. Um, I, this is mainly a moral question. Yeah, it's not a legal issue, so you know, I don't think it's relevant to say respond by saying, you know, this is a violation of the First Amendment because we're not saying it's illegal, or no, nobody's saying it's illegal. Um, but it is, it is, so the question is, is it, is it wrong to write such stories, and maybe also is it wrong to publish such stories, maybe even is it wrong to read such stories. Um, I do want to emphasize what I'm going to call uh, asymmetry, and this is that um, 
people will object to nowadays to a white person playing Othello, say, but absolutely nobody's going to object to um, Denzel Washington playing Macbeth. Um, people might object to Jodie Picot writing um, small great things, but nobody's going to object to Kasuo Ishiguro writing about the British class system and writing from the point of view of a, a white English man as he does so brilliantly in Remains of the Day, etc. I think there's there's a sort of sense that um, it's wrong for, for members of what you might call the dominant group to, to take on the identity of uh, an underrepresented identity, but not vice versa. Um, I'm going to dispute whether it's ever really wrong if, if you can do it with the right care, but I will agree with the asymmetry at least to this extent that even if it's wrong for members of the dominant group to represent members of the underprivileged or underrepresented group, um, it's not wrong for members of the underrepresented group to represent members of the dominant group. And it's worth bearing that asymmetry in mind because it has, it has a bearing on evaluations of some of the arguments. So I'm going to mention five arguments. I'm only going to talk about the first one, though, in any detail. So here are, here are five arguments that I have come across. If you have other arguments, you can, you can tell, me, tell me about them. But um, so these are, well, there they are. Um, so the first one, well, the knowledge argument I'll come back to. But the, the second one is the theft, harm, exploitation argument. And it goes like this. The um, subject or voice appropriation takes something from members of underrepresented groups just as stealing an artifact or a story or a tune does and hence deprives them of some good that belongs to them. The underrepresentation argument, um, these underrepresented folks are underrepresented in the acting and writing industries, so writing their stories is wrong. The silencing argument, if um, members of a dominant identity write stories from the point of view of underrepresented characters about their life, then readers will read fewer accounts of such lives from the underrepresented identity writers, and so the picture of such characters that emerges will be determined by the dominant identity perspective. Um, and then the offense argument. Some or all members of underrepresented groups take offense at voice appropriation. And this may be because they think it's wrong for some of the reasons explored earlier, or it just may be a brute fact, and hence we shouldn't, we shouldn't do it. Um, I'm going to focus just on the knowledge argument, and partly because we just don't have a lot of time. I'm thinking of writing a book and writing about chapters about each of these arguments, but um, I think that some of the other arguments um, presuppose the knowledge argument. So if we can sort out what to think about the knowledge argument, then maybe we can, that can make the other discussions easier. So the knowledge argument is basically, uh, you know, white people don't know what it's like seeing people don't know what it's like to be blind, et cetera. Um, so turning, trying to turn this into a ballot argument, uh, here's a, a first attempt. Argument A, if you don't belong to an identity I, then you cannot know what it's like to be an I. If you don't know what it's like to be an I, you cannot accurately portray an I. If you cannot accurately portray an I, then you should not portray an I. So if you do not belong to an identity I, then you should not portray an I. Uh, now, uh, you know, you might have an initial objection to premise three and say, well, does that mean that people shouldn't write novels about dogs or alien, you know, from the point of view of a dog or an alien or a 13th century monk? Um, this is a picture of, uh, I guess, the movie of the novel, The Art of Racing in the Rain, which was written from the point of view of a dog. And I don't think anybody has a problem with that. So let's set that aside. Um, maybe because dogs can't really be harmed by this sort of thing, or maybe because dogs aren't in a position to write their own stories. So if anybody's got to do it, it's got to be a human. Um, and just let's just suppose that this argument is focusing on the standard protected identities of race, gender, sexuality, religion, disability. Um, but the main problem that I see with argument A, as I've put it, is that it is inconsistent with um, asymmetry. Right? It, you know, think about Denzel Washington playing Macbeth. Um, you know, he's he's not a, a Scot. He's not a white man. You know, 
Um, and so he doesn't know what it's like to be that person, and so he can't accurately portray it, so he shouldn't. But the people who are objecting to cultural appropriation, I think, almost all, will reject asymmetry. So we've got to make it, we've got to um, adapt the argument to be consistent with asymmetry. So here's one stab at doing that. If you are a member of a dominant um, identity, DI, um, then you cannot know what it's like to be a member of an underrepresented identity, UI. If you don't know what it's like to be an I, you cannot accurately portray an I. If you cannot accurately portray an I, you should not portray an I. So if you're a member of a dominant identity, you should not portray a UI. Uh, somebody could be a member of uh, a dominant identity on one dichotomy and not on another. So Dave Chappelle, let's say, is black, and so is sort of a UI with respect to the white-black contrast, but is cisgendered, so he's on the dominant side of, the, of that, that one. So, um, so that has to be factored in. But, um, sorry, so this argument, uh, the, key, the key premise here is, is um, to restrict premise a, one to one star, which is his, you know, just talked about members of the dominant identity not knowing what it's like to be a member of the underrepresented identity. Um, this one star will be, will be consistent with asymmetry only if it's true that members of the underrepresented group know what it's like to be members of the dominant group. And some people claim that there's some truth to that because people in the underrepresented groups have to pay more attention. But that seems only... Uh, not always true and, and sort of very much a contingent factor to think about. So another way to go to adapt the argument would be to change argue, uh, premise C. So uh, if you do not belong to identity I, then you can't know what it's like to be an I. If you do not know what it's like to be an I, you can't accurately portray an I. And then three star says, if you are a member of uh, DI and you cannot accurately portray a UI, you should not portray a UI. So if you are a member of DI, you should not portray Um, but to make that consistent with asymmetry, then we'd have to argue that it was okay for underrepresented members of under in, underrepresented identities to represent dominant members of uh, dominant identities inaccurately. And you might say that that's true because um, that might do less damage because it's less um, less pervasive or something. I'll come back to that. So it's common to all of these arguments that, um, well, at least in some cases, but you know, in, in two of the arguments, in all cases, you can't know what it's like to be a member of an identity that you are not. Um, I'm not a man, so I can't know what it's like to be a man. I'm not black, so I can't know what it's like to be black. Um, so I want to talk about some of my own experiences as, as a reader and, and a writer in light of this, or with respect to this. So I read this book um, by Jodi Picoult, Small Great Things. Jodi Picoult is not a great literary writer, I mean, she's, but she's a very, very skilled popular writer. And this is a good book, and she really put her heart into it and did a ton of research. And she was aiming for something important and interesting about the relation between the races. But she did get some, some pushback, as I say. Here's a couple of quotes. That it's kind of long, but I'll, I'll just read through them. One is from a regular reader, and the other is from a critic in the, in the New York Journal of Books. So the first one, Jodi Picot is not black, yet she writes from the point of view of a black woman and her life struggles. She does not know our struggle. There's so many little inaccuracies throughout the book that prove that she was not in the position to tell the story. For example, Ruth got bullied for her light skin. Are you blankety blank kidding me? Yes, there is a division between light skin and dark skin, but dark skin is always, always on the losing side. There was this part where Kennedy was like, she told me about weaves and extensions. I told her about sunburns. Black people get sunburns. We know what it's like. Um, and then the other, the other quote, um, but underlying the story is a problem. Bico is trying to tell us a story that isn't hers to tell. In publishing and writing, there is currently a discussion about hashtag own voices, which means it is important for authors to write stories they are familiar with. Otherwise, the lack of information and awareness shows no matter how much research goes into it. A white woman who professes to be colorblind may not be able to really know what it feels like to be black and how racism actually works in the real world. 
Picot's gamble has not truly paid off, despite the extensive research she's put into understanding the issue from the African-American perspective. And that's by Sadia Faruqi in her new volume of books. So that's one experience. So you might think, well, that's some evidence that a white woman can't know what it's like and maybe shouldn't um, write from the point of view of a black woman. So uh, then a number of years ago, I wrote a novel that didn't go anywhere. But um, it was written from point of view of a man, and uh, I gave it to one of my male friends, and he said that I didn't really know what it's like to be a man, or I didn't, my character didn't seem to be like a typical man. Apparently men think about sex all the time, and my character did not do that. Um, so another experience of mine, also just reading, but now me reacting to it, um, this is a a book by uh, Stuart O'Nan, a very good novelist, um, and it's called The Good Wife. And this is written from the point of view of a woman, and it tells the story of a woman who um, starts, she's pregnant, and her husband is, is involved in a crime, and somehow somebody gets killed, and he's convicted of some sort of homicide and sent to prison for 20 years. And she sticks by him through all of this, in spite of the fact that it's very hard on her and on her child. And I remember reading this and thinking, oh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. that. That doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem like what a woman would do. It's just a man's perspective on things. And so I, I felt kind of a little bit like what those um, black readers of Jodie Picoult's book felt um, um, with respect to small, small great things. Um, and then lastly, uh, just recently, I have read two novels by... Uh, Asian American writers, and these are surprisingly written from the point of view of, of a white person. And I felt that the characterization of the white people in the story was a bit inaccurate. It didn't sort of, that's not how we think. You know, that was my reaction. And it felt a little bit stereotyped and, and even a bit unfair. But of course, uh, you know, Asian Americans are not as well represented in the publishing industry, so their UI is relative to me. So I, I'm not gonna say that they're doing anything wrong, it's just, but it, it sort of seemed to fit with this picture of you can't really know what it's like if you're not a member of a certain group. So my first pass um, reactions to all of these experiences. Outsiders don't know what it's like, but of course we have to remember the asymmetry. It's not wrong for a UI to write from the point of view of a dude. At least, that seems arguably correct. Um, so all of these arguments sort of assume that outsiders get it wrong. Um, I would, I, I, I don't know if this has been done, but I think it would be interesting to do a kind of uh, experiment where you um, gave a number of readers some stories and texts and had them say whether the stories fitted or clashed with their own experiences. And, but not indicate who, who, who the writer was. So, so uh, I suspect that, I suspect, I mean, part of what I'm getting here, I, I suspect part of the reaction is, I know that Stuart O'Nan's a man, so I, I say, oh, he's a man, he doesn't know what it's like. Whereas if, if, if I were reading a book by um, a woman writer, I, who, and, and her character did what the character in, in Stuart O'Nan's book did, I would just say, oh, you know, this, this woman has different values than I do. And I suspect maybe something similar if, if those readers of Jodie Picot's book had thought that she was black, they might have had a different reaction. But I think maybe the fact that we do tend to project this um, attitude of or expect to find inaccuracies is because we, maybe we have a sort of a priori argument that um, you can't know what it's like unless you are one yourself. And I'd like to look into that a little bit, and um, I want to look at a paper by a philosopher by the name of Yuri Kath called, the paper's called Knowing What It's Like and Testimony, and this paper was published in the Australian Journal of Philosophy in 2019, I believe. And Kath is not writing about cultural appropriation in this paper. He's writing about um, some work by David Lewis and Frank Jackson and um, Laurie Paul in connection with Rory Paul's stuff about transformative experience. 
Um, but he's, he's exploring this claim that you can't know what it's like to be an X unless you've directly experienced X. Or he, he, he has other examples. Not, it's not just being, a, being black or being Native American or being a woman. It includes things like seeing red or being in war or having a child. Um, so he starts the paper with, with a paradox, and this paradox seems very um, sort of connect with some thoughts that I've had, and it seems relevant to our topic. So the two parts of the paradox are this. A, you can't know what it's like to be an X if you're not an X. And B, it's worthwhile to read memoirs and very realistic novels by Xs to learn what it's like to be an X even if you're not an X. Um, so for example, um, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass's autobiography is, is a good place to learn a bit about slavery and, and about the black experience. Um, Sherman Alexie's um, bio, uh, memoir uh, about his life growing up on the reservation is you know, a good place to learn about something about Native American life. Uh, Jan Morris is a, a trans woman, and her, her memoir, uh, Conundrum, is, is a really interesting portrait of, of somebody growing up and you know, living as a man, but knowing she was a woman, and eventually going through the transition. Um, so, turning this into a little uh, argument, um, either outsiders can know what it's like to be an ex, or they cannot. If they can, then the knowledge argument fails. If they cannot, then there's no point in promoting the reading of fictional memoirs by hashtag own voices as a way to learn what it's like to be an ex because um, learning seems to entail coming to know, at least partially. And so that seems to be a problem. Now, I, I'm not, I don't mean to suggest that the only reason to publish memoirs by black people or Native Americans or trans people is for the benefit of, of the dominant culture. But that does seem to be part of um, how they're marketed and, and the justification for, I mean, well, part of their, their um, way of making money is to be sold to inform others uh, and so forth. So either way, there seems to be some kind of a problem. Um, so Kath's own response to this is to um, distinguish senses. This is very much a philosophical move. And so he says there, there um, when it comes to knowing what it's like, he, he says there, there are different or different senses or different ways one can do this. So he talks a little bit about Frank Jackson's Mary in her black and white room. And, you know, so Mary is, um, she's in a black and white room. She, she's never seen anything red, but she has really good theoretical knowledge of the neurophysiology of, of red experiences. And maybe she can even distinguish very well between things that are red and things that are not red. Um, but she doesn't have that quality, that red, you know, the thing that you get when you look at a strawberry. Um, so she doesn't have the phenomenology of red. So we can say, you know, you and I, who do have the phenomenology of red, we have what he calls gold standard knowledge, whereas um, Mary has bronze standard that's just theoretical. But he, he suggests an intermediate standard, which is what he calls the silver standard, which is um, you can kind of conjure up the phenomenology by way of... Um, comparing it with other experiences you've had, and maybe by testimony. So maybe if there are two fruits that taste exactly alike, you know, maybe, I, I can't think of a good example of this, but let's say grapefruits and ugly fruits taste exactly the same. I don't, don't tell me if that's false. I'm just, this is just a made-up example. Um, but suppose you've tasted both, and I've only tasted grapefruit, and you might tell me, and I trust you, they taste exactly alike. So now, it seems like I kind of know what an ugly fruit tastes like in that, in that scenario. Or suppose I don't know what marijuana smells like, and you might say, well, it's kind of like skunk, but not quite as disgusting. Or, or, or he has other examples about, um, well, you know, you might think about, you've never been skydiving, but you have a virtual reality experience or IMAX experience of skydiving. Or, you know, and may maybe reading very well-written books or, or watching movies can give us 
um, some glimpse of the phenomenology of the experience, even though we haven't ourselves uh, directly experienced it. Now, he says that um, the silver standard comes in degrees. Um, so um, somebody who's, who's, you know, maybe he, he talks about a, a person who wrote a book called What's It Like to Go to War and has, has not herself been to war, but she has talked to hundreds of veterans and she's very carefully described the experiences. And, and he thinks she, someone like her might have a better understanding of what it's like to go to war than someone else who's maybe only talked to a few veterans and only has a partial partial account. Um, anyway, so he thinks he can resolve the paradox somewhat by um, saying, well, you, A is true in, the, with respect to gold standard, right? You can, you can only have gold standard knowledge of what it's like to be an X if you've experienced X, but you can come to acquire silver standard knowledge um, of what it's like to be an X if you attend to the testimony of those with first-hand knowledge. So, you, so people can read memoirs to get, to get greater and less, you know, greater degree of uh, silver standard knowledge. But I had a couple of questions about this. Um, um, he, maybe he does answer this, and maybe I need to read the paper for a third or fourth time to cl be clear on this, but it, it doesn't really matter what he thinks. Um, one question you might ask is, you know, does gold standard just mean firsthand, or does it also mean the best, or does it mean uh, first-hand and thereby the best. And one wonders, I wonder, if a gold standard experience could also be, um, could come in degrees and also be somewhat subpar. And even if it might be possible for some silver standard experiences to be better than some gold standard experiences. So one example is, I hope we're allowed to talk about alcohol here. Uh, <laughs> okay. So my Merlot experience. So I have... A, drunk some Merlot, and so I have, um, I suppose, a gold standard experience of Merlot, but I'm not good with this stuff. I, you know, if you were to ask me to pick out a Merlot out of three glasses of wine, I, you know, my chances of getting it right would be one in three. Um, ask me to describe it, not good. So I imagine somebody who's a real connoisseur of wine who has t tasted hundreds of wine, but somehow has never tasted a Merlot, but who has a great vocabulary of wine and you know all the subtle distinctions, they might be able to, by talking to some of their peers, they might get a, a better guess at what Merlot is like than what I have. So maybe, at least in that case, they might have a better, their silver standard knowledge might be better than my gold standard knowledge. Well, going back to the experience of war, um, you know, somebody might have been to war but never have had any experience of, of fighting and never seen anyone killed, injured, never themselves fired in, in, in a conflict situation. So that person ex would technically have a gold standard experience of going to war, but might not have as good a knowledge as the person who wrote that collection with, in light of hundreds of com conversations with veterans. Or going back to this book, American Dirt, um, apparently Janine Crimin, um, Cummins, excuse me, who wrote this? Who wrote this book? Actually, has a um, Puerto Rican grandmother, and so she, you know, by some people's reckoning, counts as um, a Hispanic person, and yet um, she she appears to be white, and she I don't know what her home life was like, but suppose it was not really steeped in that culture. So you might think she didn't have as you know she didn't have a thorough full-blown Hispanic experience from which to write to write the, um, the book. Um, and another one, another example, uh, Laurie Paul always talks about motherhood, you know. If you haven't had a child, you can't know what it's like to be a parent. And so you're taking great chances when you leap into, into parenthood. But again, we might think about, you know, like the queen. These uh, two kids here are... Um, Charles and, and uh, Anne, and the Queen's two children, a long time ago. Um, and I'm presuming that they were raised by nannies most of the time, and, and the Queen herself did not change diapers and maybe didn't nurse and didn't see her kids moment to moment. She just sort of patted them on the head um, after their baths. And 
So you might think, well, she doesn't have a full-blown... And if, if this is not true of her, if, I'm sorry, Elizabeth, but uh, presumably there, <laughs> there are some aristocrats who have this kind of, kind of parentage, and maybe their nannies are much better, f or, you know, much more familiar with the ins and outs of parenthood than they are. Um, but, uh, you know, suppose we turn to some lesser, uh, some better cases of, of first-hand experience like this person who's obviously been in the war and, and this person who's obviously a good mother, and or even me, you know, I, I'm a pretty crappy um, Merlot person, but I, I think I was okay mom, a pretty hands-on mom. But um, even, even, you know, even my experience of being a mother is, is, is it's kind of narrow, right? I mean, I had two sons, and but I never, you know, I never had a daughter, so I don't always like to be the parent of a daughter. I don't always like to be the parent of a kid with a disability. I don't always like to be the parent of a child prodigy, or, although my kids are pretty special. Um, I I don't know, you know, what it's like to be a black mother. I don't know what it's like to be a single mother. I don't know what it's like to be a stay-at-home mother. I don't, you know, I I have a fairly small range of motherhood experiences, like any, I think any mother would have to have. Um, so I think um, someone like uh, Lewis or um, Paul might say, um, people who've had the experience um, is, you know, have, have an inarticulable extra element that, that the people who've only got the silver standard thing can only miss out on. And that makes their experience somehow different and special. Um, and I like to think about that a little bit in particular in connection with, with this cultural appropriation debate. So here's a, here's a little imaginary scenario of this. Um, suppose that um, a group of people have some very profound religious experience, like say, like seeing, the burning, seeing God talking out of the burning bush like Moses did. And Suppose they have this experience, and it's a very profound experience. Maybe it leads them to start a new religion or have, have a, you know, to change in their religious life. And they, they tell this story to their children. And let's call the people who had the experience the first-handers and the people who, had, who hear the story the second-handers. And now the second-handers perhaps will pass this on to their children, who we might call the third-handers. Um, and if um, this, this idea of the incommunicable extra, this qualitative thing that can't be passed on is, is correct, then the first-handers will not pass on that inarticulable extra element. Um, but I wonder if what gets passed on from the second-handers to the third-handers is in any way has to be inferior to what gets passed on originally from the first-handers to the second-handers. And obviously what's the, the second-handers don't have that inarticulable element, but I wonder if, if that makes their stories any, their, their account of this burning bush experience inferior. Because by definition, the first group couldn't pass the inarticulable element on, right? It was inarticulable. That meant that it couldn't be passed on. So I'm wondering if somehow that extra inarticulable element could make the first-handed stories better than the second-handed stories. And I kind of don't see how it could. Maybe, maybe there's some mystical way in which it could, but, um, you know, if it's articulable, you can pass it on. If it's not articulable, it can't be part of your story, so it can't make your story better. Uh, so I'm going to go back to my own experiences in light of this discussion. Uh, I'm just going to focus on two of these. Um, the good, so the good wife. I, my first reaction to the good wife was, um, yeah, I wouldn't do what the character did. Um, Stuart O'Neill doesn't know what it's like to be a woman. But then I, fairly shortly after that, I, I checked myself and I thought, well, can I be confident that I can speak for all women? You know, I wouldn't do what she did, but does that follow that a woman wouldn't do what she did? So maybe I could ask my friends. I have lots of female friends, and I can ask them about this. I didn't, but I, I could. And you know, it's possible that they would all agree with me. But it's possible also that they're an unrepresentative sample. They're my friends, after all. 
So maybe I could do a survey. I could put out a, a vast random survey and ask women whether they, how they would react to this scenario. And either they're going to um, all agree with me, or, or let's say you know, maybe 99% of them are going to agree with me, in which case I think I would be vindicated in my judgment, or um, perhaps a sizable minority of them, like 15% say, would say, no, no, I would do what um, Stuart O'Neill's character would do. In that case, I think, I think he's off the hook because he's represented as a, a woman, you know, a realistic way for a woman to behave. So, but then it occurred to me that, you know, um, Stuart O'Neill could ask his female friends, he's married to a woman, and he could ask her, he could ask his other friends, he could do a survey. The only advantage that I have over him is my own introspective experience. He doesn't, he doesn't have access to the inner mind of any particular woman, but, but he's got access to uh, all the other friends and all the other women out there. So I don't know that that gives me uh, that good of a, uh, that doesn't put me in that good of a position to criticize his book. And after I had all those thoughts, I came across this great quote from Zadie Smith. Zadie Smith, I'm sure you all know, is a, a British writer um, of Jamaican descent, very, very famous, written a ton of really good books. And anyway, she, um, here's a quote from The Guardian. Asked how she felt about cultural appropriation, she told an audience in early 2000 at a festival in Colombia, if someone says to me, a black girl would never say that, I'm saying, how can you possibly know? The problem with that argument is it assumes the possibility of total knowledge of humans. The only thing that identifies people in their entirety is their name. I'm a Zadie. Um, so it's not like she's saying something very similar to, to what I was saying. Um, so this sort of gets me to a question. Um, so the argument, the knowledge argument that I've been talking about seems to be assuming that um, you can't know what it's like to be an ex if if you're not an ex. So a necessary condition of knowing what it's like to be an ex is being an ex. But a question that I'm interested in now is, is what is a sufficient condition? What is a sufficient condition for knowing what it's like to be an ex? And some of this discussion, the gold standard point, seemed to suggest that a sufficient condition for knowing what it's like to be an ex is to be an ex. So necessary and sufficient condition for knowing what it's like is being it. So I'm a woman, so I know what it's like to be a woman. I'm not a man, so I don't know what it's like to be a man. I'm white, so I know what it's like to be white. I'm not um, black, so I don't know what it's like to be black. But I'm also human, so does that mean I know what it's like to be human? Sure. I'm a mammal, so does that mean I know what it's like to be a mammal? Well, a bat is a mammal, so do I know what it's like to be a bat? Presumably not. Um, so maybe what it comes down to, knowing my knowing what it's like to be a woman really just comes down to there's some woman W such that I know what it's like to be W. So Zadie knows what it's like to be Zadie. Francis knows what it's like to be Francis. And even then, you know, maybe I don't fully know what it's like to be me because I don't remember all that well being 10 or being 16. And even now, maybe I'm a little self-deceived. So I'm not necessarily perfect even when it comes to my own self-knowledge. Um, I don't want to, I definitely don't want to, so I, I, I'm a little skeptical about this notion of knowing what it's like, or even if there is such a thing as what it's like to be a woman, or what it's like to be black, etc. Um, I don't mean to suggest that people get a total free pass to write whatever they like about various members of various identities. I, I definitely don't want to. I know that there are, there have been, and probably still are, some very ugly stereotypes out there. Um, it, this is a picture of uh, Lily Gladstone who won the uh, Golden Globe and in her speech she, she was talking about how um, Native Americans have been represented badly in, in movies for many years and I think that's true and she gave one anecdote she said that um, back in the day people the producers would have the Native Americans speak in English and then play his or her lines in reverse, just sort of gobbledy gobbled, you know, some gar gobbled sounds, and pretend that that was Native American speech. And that, of course, is just one tiny example of 
how people have been misrepresented. So I think you know there there are legitimate worries about misrepresentation, and I, I don't mean to deny that. Um, I uh, also want to talk about my experience with the um, these two novels by Asian writers, and. Um, as I say, my first reaction was to think, oh, these characters are so horrible. They, they you know, exhibit these horrible stereotypical ways of thinking, and, and it seems sort of unfair, etc. But then, you know, I, I remembered the point that I made about Onan's book, that, you know, um, the fact that I, as a white person, don't see myself in, in these characters um, doesn't necessarily mean that these are inaccurate representations of, of white people. There, there are some really horrible white people out there in the world, and I see them on TV all the time. Here are some horrible white people. Here are some more horrible white people. I could go on and on, but I won't. So yeah, I mean, the fact that these two characters were horrible doesn't mean that they're inaccurately portrayed. Um, but then you know, I thought, well, these are like these are Democrats, and they're like. Liberals, and they're one of them is even a professor in a Northwest University, a English professor, not a philosophy professor, but still, kind of a little close to home. And it seemed a little, you know, one, there were several, actually, several white characters. One of them turns up at a party in blackface, and this is like in 19, 2016. So it seemed a little, seemed a little inaccurate. But um, at that point, I thought, well, maybe there's something of value here that, you know, maybe these are stereotypes and maybe I'm kind of getting a little bit of insight into tiny inkling into what it feels like to have my, you know, people of my racial group stigmatized, you know, stereotype and stigmatized. And um, because of the asymmetry, I'm not really allowed to complain or I shouldn't, I shouldn't think there's anything wrong with that, but I kind of get an inkling of, of how it feels, and I can extrapolate to it must feel a lot worse if you're getting a lot of that. But then the other reaction I had, maybe this is the one that you've anticipated, is um, maybe there's something accurate about this. Maybe maybe I should actually um, learn something. Maybe I am a target here and um, of criticism, and, and maybe, maybe I should recognize these defects in myself and accept the rebuke. Um, and I, I think, um, I think, in the end, I think maybe my third, the, the truth is somewhere between my third and fourth. Maybe there are some stereotypes that are inaccurate, but also maybe there's, maybe there's some accuracy here, and maybe there's something of value that I can learn from seeing how myself and other white people are, are portrayed, are seen. And, um, but if that's true, then, um, Maybe there is some value in the view from the outside. Uh, I think we often assume that the, interest, the um, introspective perspective, the point of view from the inside, is, is the, the best, the most accurate point of view. But I think it is possible that people get themselves wrong and mistaken in what they're like. And you can see this on an, in an, um, on an individual basis in thinking about maybe particular people you know or particular characters. Um, here are two um, famous characters from literature. The first is Anthony Hopkins playing um, the butler Stevens in the movie It Remains of the Day. And he's a very sad character, but he, he seems not to understand himself at all. And the reader clearly understands him better than he understands himself. The other one is Mr. Collins um, from Pride and Prejudice, I don't know who the actor is, but it was a marvelous portrayal in the 1997 Pride and Prejudice, which was the ultimate Pride and Prejudice. But, I mean, we're familiar with this trope of a, of a person who doesn't really know their own character very well. And these are dramatic examples of that, but I'm sure there are other, other less extreme examples that you are aware of in your, your own life. So there's some value in the view from the outside. Um, I do want to... So I, I think, I hope I've cast some doubt on the, on the knowledge argument. Um, I haven't addressed the other arguments. But um, there may remain some residual, even after we talk about those other arguments, if we were to do that, there may remain some re residual sense that cultural appropriation is 
morally prima facie wrong. But I would like to mention some things that I think are good about what I've called cultural appropriation, neutrally defined, and that might offset the, the prima facie negativity. So one is some works by um, that are count as cultural appropriation are, are great works. So Othello would be a, a good example. I was going to mention Merchant of Venice, but possibly that has done more harm than good. Um, Another thing that seems to be good is um, diverse representation. It seems good that there be um, characters of color in, in, in lots of stories. And um, I think the, the people who hate cultural appropriation think that, yeah, they should be because there should be more um, people of color writing those stories. But one way to have more characters of color or, or underrepresented identities is to have white people or people of dominant identity write them. Um, this is so uh, this is particularly poignantly true in the case of uh, children's books. I think uh, characters of color are, are underrepresented. And um, it seems that to make sense for even white, white writers to, to include characters of color. If, you know, especially they can do it with, you know, do complex, interesting uh, not stereotypical kind of characters. This is a, a book written, um, illustrated, I think it's illustrated, not written, but illustrated by my friend Andrea Gabriel, and she's white, and she deliberately chose to put a black kid on the, on the cover of this book. But there are, there are many other um, examples, both in children's literature and in um, literature for adults. Uh, in the um, very lovely book, uh, The Sympathizer by Viet... Wind, a Vietnamese American writer, he um, he has a character. This is set in about 1970. He has a, char a Vietnamese character who um, participates in the making of a movie, and it's supposed to be kind of like Platoon or um, Apocalypse Now. It's a movie about the Vietnam War, and this um, person struggles to try to get the movie to represent Vietnamese characters as as full three dimensional characters rather than just hapless victims or or villains, and he doesn't really succeed. But but the argument seems to be, you know, those movies should be representing the point of view of, of the, the Vietnamese, not just the, the Americans. Um, and there are, there are other examples like that. Um, I think it's also a good thing that there be stories written about um, interactions between people of different races or people of different identities. And if a single author is going to do that, he or she is going to have to do it, go outside of his or her identity. So like uh, Jodie Picoult, we talked about that before. Um, also, um, uh, The Heaven and Earth uh, Grocery Store by James McBride, that he is, in fact, a, a black writer. And this is a story about uh, interaction between a Jewish community and black community, and he writes from the point of view of both, both, both sides. But it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Now, you might say, well, it, those books should only be written by what I've called UIs, not by DIs. But I think it's good that books be written, books about those issues be written by, from all angles. Um, I think there's some value in people having the opportunity to, well, I think artistic expression, freedom of artistic expression is a good thing. Um, I did earlier say it's not a legal matter, but I think if publishing houses are going to just not accept any books by that, are, that engage in cultural appropriation, then they're going to limit the freedom for writers, which seems to me a prima facie a bad thing. It also seems to me a bad thing. Um, so I, I said, I was talking about the asymmetry a lot, but I think, I think there's tendency for um, belief in cultural appropriation or Problem, to ha having a problem with cultural appropriation, to go along with the idea that we expect black writers to write about black stories and we expect Vietnamese writers to write about Vietnamese stories, and et cetera. And um, the new movie that was just nominated for an Oscar, American fiction, fantastic movie, um, kind of depicts that. This, 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 this guy, this black guy who wants to write stories about ancient Rome and, and he's told by his editors that his stories aren't black enough, so he, he comes up with this horrible parody of 
the black story. But it's, it's um, so I think, overall, I think, um, um, I mean, I, I think there, there's something, you know, I, I, I do think that, that the criticisms of cultural appropriation have some, um, you know, they're, they're, they're really onto something about, problem. there are problematic cases. I mean, so examples that I started with, you know, clearly fraud, theft, plagiarism. Um, there have been horrible examples of stereotyping and misrepresentation that should be avoided. But I think with, um, if you, you know, use a lot of care, research, empathy, then I think um, it can be a good thing, should be permitted for people to write from from any 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 identity. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a super interesting question. Um, I don't think motherhood is is ten, generally in this debate about cultural appropriation. That was just sort of an example of knowing what's like. But, but yeah, I mean the the general question. Um, I th there is there's a paper, um, cultural appropriation and cultural essentialism by um, Eric Mathis Alala, I, th I think. Um, but the cultural appropriation and cultural essentialism are in the title. And he explores this question about um, does a concern with cultural appropriation lead to kind of uh, essentialism, saying, you know, you're not, you're not, um, like with the, the author of American Dirt, you know, you're not Hispanic enough, or, you know, somebody who, uh, you know, you're not enough of a mother. And, and that, that is potentially problematic because a lot of people are sort of on the borderline you know you maybe you somebody was a Native American but they were adopted in a white family do they they don't have the cultural experience do they count as an African uh, Native American enough um, you know trans person is that you know do how do we do we, do we say yes she's definitely a, a woman or not um, and and there could be lots of other examples so so I think this is potentially a problem for Critics of cultural appropriation, although there may there may be ways around it, but uh, I mean, with with the with the with the specific case of motherhood that you talk about, I I, I know there is um, debate about biological parents versus adoptive parents, and I think the the way culture is going is that adoptive parents count as full-blooded parents. Um, um, but you know, the, the the reason they count is because they were the ones who did all the work. They were the ones who were you know. Um, up at night with a sick kid, etc. But you might argue that the nanny, you know, the nanny is playing that role, and maybe a nanny knows a kid from from babyhood up till adulthood, and and is the one the kid cries, you know, and, and does the it does all the work. So you may say, 
maybe she's, you know, strictly speaking, maybe maybe she counts as the true mother. Um, or maybe, you know, maybe there's no maybe there's no ultimate answer to those to those questions. But but I think if you're going to be drawing these, it's a problem for the people who want to draw those sharp lines. It's not so much a problem for someone who wants to say, you know, be careful, but you can anybody can can write from the point of view. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I didn't actually include that in my. Um, so I guess the question would be, or at least for for someone who does think cultural appropriation is a bad thing, is it is the focus on the victimized group, or is is it on the group that's doing the the borrowing? And if you think, um, yeah. So so I. Some some people might might object. I mean, I, I hadn't thought of that objection in particular. But do the Japanese people who do that get the, do they get criticized for it? And Yeah, that's a really good good case. I think I should, um, if I had a pen, I would make a note of that, but I'll try to remember it because it's, um, I mean, you could have a version of the knowledge or whatever argument that says uh, it's wrong for members of the dominant identity to cultural appropriate. Or you could have another version that says it's wrong for members of a underrepresented group to be culturally appropriated. If you took the latter one, you'd say the case was in, the case that you described was a case of wrongful behavior. But, but yeah, in, it's an interesting case. I mean, it kind of depends where the emphasis is. I mean, I, I suppose, it, I mean, the, the Japanese are, are just as likely to make mistakes about African culture as, as white people are. So if, if you're worried about misrepresentations, then maybe you should say that that's wrong. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm I'm open to the idea that maybe it can make some some subtle difference to the quality of the story. That that yeah, I, mean, I think that I think that's an interesting suggestion. That it maybe yeah, that's that's kind of cool. Then um, coming in the voice that's not exactly propositional in the content, but um, yeah, that's that's interesting.
um, I, I don't know if it was especially important. I, w I was just thinking well, maybe somebody like um, Laurie Paul or David Lewis or Frank Jackson might say, um, person who's actually had the experience has something extra that even the best silver standard knowledge can't um, capture. And it's it's something inarticulable. It's just this, what it feels like to see red or what it feels like to give birth or whatever. And, and then I, I was thinking, well, okay, maybe that's true. And it's sort of plausible in the case of red. But would that, if, if you now think of the first-hand experienced person as a writer putting it into a story, um, if it was genuinely inarticulable, they, they couldn't put it, it, it wouldn't add to the quality of their story. So their story wouldn't be better than somebody who, a second-hander who learned it at their knee, you know, or did a ton of research. And so that, that was my sort of thought there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Sorry, I I I need to handle the minute. Uh -huh. Yes. Oh. Interesting. Wow. Okay. Oh, that would be interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yuval Harari. Yeah. He was sapient. Yeah, Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, um, so the criticism was probably not that it was inaccurate, but that it was sort of a theft, and it, it was, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I think it's a little bit like there, there, there have been some cases of 
taking something that sort of has a religious connotation like the, the Indian headdress and using that. And there, I think maybe, you know, if, if there really is a religious prohibition on doing this, then maybe we shouldn't do it, you know, out of respect for their religion. So, so if, if it is like that, then, um, but if it, Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I don't, I, I guess I, yeah, I mean, if, you know, if she, she were to do a sort of Monet style or a Van Gogh style, I, I don't, nobody would have a problem. So I, I don't know that borrowing a style is, really counts as problematic theft, particularly if you acknowledge it and you say this is done in the style of such and such a person. So I, I guess I would have, a, I would object to the sort of theft critique um, you know, I, I don't know what the cultural conventions are, and it could be that it's it's some sort of religious violation. In which case, I would say maybe it is. Well, maybe we need to defer to them on that. But um, I guess not. So, I, depending on what the argument is, depending on what the exact situation is, I would kind of agree or disagree. I don't think the mere fact that people find something offensive by itself is a reason not to do it. I, I, I don't think the mere fact that people get offended by something is a reason not to do it. Um, or else, you know, all of our late, late night comedians would be in trouble for making fun of our politicians. Um, so I, um, I think, you know, if, if somebody's offended because it really is problematic for one of these other reasons, then look at those other reasons. I don't think the mere existence of offense is, is a valid objection. So it, I, I don't have a solution. I'm sorry you had to go through that uncomfortable situation. Yeah, but for both of you, this because I mean, obviously, it sounds like it was very important to the student, and meaningful, and uh, was this person a person of some other, uh, an Aboriginal person, or is it? Uh, yeah. yeah, there was a. Um, there was a case of um, some young girl, uh, a prom, who wore a, a, I think it was a Chinese dress, and it, she put it on Facebook, or put it on, sorry, not Facebook, Instagram or something, and um, a lot of sort of white liberals kind of came back, how dare you, and, but a, a lot of Chinese people came back and said, oh, lovely, you know, you're, you're, you're honoring our culture, and, and so um, I, I don't know what, exactly what the relevance of that is, but it's a little bit more relevant to look at what the actual people themselves are saying in response. And, and, that, and you know, who knows what the um, Aboriginal artists would say about your student. Maybe they'd be, maybe, maybe they'd be more, you know, she, you know she's, she's that's, that's cool what she's doing, but um, I think white liberals are often a little bit sort of overly, maybe in some cases overly careful. I, I don't know. Yes. Yeah. I haven't seen the play either, so. Um, so I, I don't think culture, I mean, I've tried to argue that I don't think cultural appropriation is such a bad thing. Um, but what would a critic of cultural appropriation say about, about that? Um, well, I mean, I, I suppose they might say, you know, Mormons are sort of Christians and they're and they're white, so they're in the sort of dominant group. So we can, you know, we're punching up when we criticize them. Or maybe they would say, you know, Mormons are are a minority culture in our in our society, and so it just would follow from every, you know, from those criticisms that it, it, it's a problematic thing. Um, um, I, I, like you, I haven't seen the play, so I, 
I suspect you know maybe there is some unfair mockery in in such a play, and that 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 seems problematic, you know, aside from cultural appropriation objections. It's if you make fun of the most sacred elements in someone's life, then that that's that is either morally wrong or morally risky. So that, but I. How inaccurate or how cruel the, the mocking is. Uh, that might, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, and? Dave Chappelle. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I don't know that I would describe what Dave Chappelle does as, as cultural appropriation, but I was it was just supposed to be an illustration of sort of punching up versus punching down, and you know that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think comedy is supposed to be offensive, I, 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 but I do think there's a line. I mean, I, I do think some some kinds of comedy kind of cross that line in, in a way objectionable, and I don't exactly know where where that line would be, but um, yeah, and I. I haven't really followed his comedy that closely, so I, I can't exactly say where where the offense line is. But I, I do think that there. Um, I mean, I kind of get a little bit of the feeling of, you know, it's a little bit more okay to make fun of white black people to make fun of white people than than vice versa. It, there is some element of that because of the because of the historic asymmetry of of oppression and so on. Um, I guess I'm kind of on the side of letting letting people get away with it. But of course, you know, if you find it offensive, then you can choose not to pay to watch or pay pay to buy or pay to and so uh, that's legitimate it seems like a legitimate response too. Sorry if that's not very helpful. That's a hard question. I, um, do they do they get do missionaries get accused of cultural appropriation, as opposed to just like cultural um, imperialism, maybe? Or um, uh, I mean, I, I think I really think that if you believe you you know the truth, I think it's reasonable to go and tell people that and try to persuade people of that. So I don't think the mere Trying to persuade people of the truth of Christianity could be problematic. Um, I reject the kind of ethical or religious relativism that says, you know, um, just you know, there's different truths in different places and different times. Um, um, I, you know, I obviously think you have to be respectful when you're trying to persuade someone of something. You, you, you don't want to bully them into it, but I don't think that going and telling people the truth as you see it is inherently problematic. I mean, I know some people think it is, but I, you know, you, you want to
to you want to pass the truth on and say bless you, bless you, thank you. Yes. Fair enough. Okay, so um, I guess what I was maybe th that yeah that was that was me being a little silly when I took it at the back there. Um, I guess my point was I know what it's like to be a wo woman that doesn't give me license to say I know um, what it's like to be any or all women, um, and in fact maybe I don't know any women beyond myself, right, from that inside out. So that doesn't give me this direct sort of knowledge that enables, would enable me to write a story about a woman who is different from myself. And it also doesn't give me the right to criticize um, Kay Stewart, a man, writing about a woman that does something different from me. So, um, I mean, maybe part of it is a little bit of skepticism about there being something that it is like to be a woman. Um, my colleague Jennifer can suggest it to me that maybe that's what the skepticism is. It's not an epistemology sort of skepticism, it's a metaphysical skepticism. There is no such thing as what it's like to be a woman, or what it's like to be a man or a woman. And, um, you know, we each only know the, in that very intimate gold standard-y sort of way, we only know one, one little tiny patch of it, and we have to use imagination and research and testimony and empathy and so on to get out from that to other women or other whatever. And in the same way that we we can do that same thing when we write about black people or gay people or whatever. Disabled people. So that was that was the that was the thought behind it. But yeah, you're right. I mean, obviously I'm not a bat, so I by my own reasoning I, I, I don't know what it's like to be a bat. But um, so I was being a little frivolous with that, that point there. Um, and you're right, it was an invalid argument. But the general point is, um, this is sort of skepticism about there being a thing that it's like to be a woman, just in that general sense. Yeah. 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 I think that's you know either you know either universal quantifier or existential quantifier. You know, some woman that I know such like, uh, but maybe there's some third sort of intermediate. You know. I know what it's like to be a generic woman, even if maybe I don't know what it's like. But every single woman, I, is some, you know, may, maybe, maybe, maybe the debate here is, you know, is there some sort of essence of womanhood that I have access to that you don't, you know, or essence of blackness that a black person has access to? But that starts to get a little, maybe a little risky. You know, is there such a thing as an essence of a womanhood or, or an essence of blackness? I, I don't know.
Thank you for those great questions. I'm going to answer.